church, let's stand and worship and sing together today. We're so glad that you're here. Let's worship and lift up our King. Let's put our hands together today. Good morning, Northeast. It's so good to see all of you today. I'm Corbin. I'm a worship pastor here at this campus, and uh, we're thrilled to join together with you uh, both in the room and online. Thank you all for being with us and uh, giving up time of your day to gather in the name of Jesus, the name that unites and binds us all. Hey, it's, it's a very, very exciting time of the year. We really get to kick off this new season where we get to remember and we get to reflect and we get to honor our God, who loves us so very much uh, that he humbled himself to become one of us and come to this earth in such a fragile form as a, a human child 
a little baby with, uh, we expected him to come in different ways. We expected him to be this ruler and this king and this conqueror, but he chose to be the most fragile, innocent little child because he loves us so much and he wanted to show us that he was willing to be fragile and he was willing to suffer and willing to hurt just like we hurt. So today, uh, I want to invite you to do something as we go into our time of worship. We're going to pray, and I want to encourage you to uh, actually take a posture of receiving today, uh, to actually extend your hands out like this if you're comfortable with that. And uh, as we pray, I believe God is pouring something out. His spirit is flowing in this place. And uh, sometimes I think taking a physical posture to receive helps us frame our mind and frame our sight on him and what he's doing that he's giving to us. So let's pray together and I want to encourage you to do that with me around this room. Father, we thank you that you have come. We thank you that you came and walked among us and lived among us and died for us. We thank you that your spirit is here today. And so today we ask that we hear from you. We see you not just an idea of you, but we see something that we know only you could do, God, because you are a God of miracles. You are a God of healing, a God that changes lives. And people in this room need breakthrough today, God. So I pray that that breakthrough comes and we ask to receive from you. We apologize for the ways that we have separated ourselves and hid from you, God. But today we ask that you break down those walls, you kick in those doors, and that we get to see you face to face today, Jesus. We love you, it's in your name that we pray and we worship, amen. amen.
Passing off inside oh. Son's name that we pray. Amen. You can take a seat. I invite our serving teams forward as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive communion. In May, our oldest son, Elliot, graduated from DuPont Manual High School. 
and lots of preparations went into making that day a really special day. Graduation parties, making sure we had the list correct to invite family and friends. And on the morning of graduation, I think I told him 10 times, do not forget your cap and gown and your tassel. And we had a great day together. But as soon as graduation day was over, we began making preparations for college making sure he knew how to do his laundry, making sure he had everything he needed for his dorm room, making sure he had his classes scheduled and his books ordered. And I had to begin preparing myself for the day that we would take him to the University of Cincinnati. I was prepared emotionally. I told myself, I am not going to cry. It is going to be a glorious day. It was actually a really rainy day, and we had fun together walking around campus, making sure he was acclimated to everything, but the time came for the final goodbye. You know, he was ready for us to go. You can go now, Mom and Dad. So I hugged him tight. I told him how proud I was of him, and Wally hugged him, and then we turned around to walk away. I looked at Wally. He was completely fine, but I was a mess. <laughs> And I got to the car and I nearly lost it. It didn't say much on the way home. So you can imagine that since he has been at college, we have really missed him around the house. His brother cannot wait for him to come home at Christmas for Fortnite duos. The dog has missed him. And we have just missed his presence at home and all of his friends that he used to bring over. It's like we lost a whole clan when he left. So I've been preparing for him to come home at Christmas making sure the house is ready and the food is prepared to, to make his favorite meals. And soon he will be home for Christmas and it's gonna be awesome to have us all under the same roof. In the same manner, Christ followers, those of us who have placed our trust and faith in Jesus, have to prepare ourselves, our hearts, for the birth of Jesus. We need to make sure that our hearts are a dwelling place for God. More than any other time of the year, I believe Christmas time is a time of prayer and reflection. If you have not sat down and just, and just reflected on what God has done for you this year, I challenge you to do that this week. Emmanuel, God with us. The baby Jesus was the Word made flesh, and He dwelt among us, and then He went to the cross and he died for you and me. And during this season of the year, we celebrate his birth. But every week when we gather here, we are reminded that he loves us. Psalm 36, 7 says, How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. So wherever you are in your journey of faith today, I pray that you will just rest in God. Take refuge in him and remember what he has done for you. So let us take the bread now that represents Jesus' body broken for us. And let us take the cup that represents his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sin. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, you are a good God, and we are so thankful for your presence with us today. During this time of the year, help us to remember to rest in you, to lay aside technology, lay aside our cell phones, and in your presence, just enjoy the company of family and friends. God, you are a good God, and we thank you for all that you have done for us. We believe that every good and perfect gift is from you, and today we praise you for that. It is in the strong name of Jesus we pray, amen. Invite our servers back forward as we collect our tithes and offerings. Here at Northeast, we are passionate about boldly changing lives now, and you have done that in amazing ways this year. And in just a few moments, you will hear Tyler tell you about all the great work that God has done through you. But today I want to announce that in 2019, we are expanding our Love the Ville movement to West Louisville. So I want to invite Marla and Bill on stage from Hand in Hand Ministries. Would you give me, would you help me give them a hand? 
Our staff was able to serve with Hand in Hand at our staff day in October, and they are doing great work in West Louisville. They relocated their offices to Portland in 2017, and we met with them earlier this year. We asked in Love the Ville fashion, how can we help? And they told us many ways that we could help, and we really held on to two of those ways. One is they said, join us in West Louisville. Help us do home repair, street cleanup, alley cleanup, so that not any other homes are boarded up with plywood windows. And so you're going to have the opportunity to do that in 2019. And second, they said, we have a mortgage of about $57,000. We prayed big prayers. We trusted God. We moved our offices to Portland. So anything that you could do financially to help us with our mortgage would be great. So we've seen the great work that you guys are doing. We know that you're meeting uh, with residents. You're going to neighborhood association meetings. I was at uh, Save-A-Lot on Portland. Avenue met James, the manager, and he said, hey, do you know Marla and Bill? And I said, yes, I do. And we talked about the great work that you're doing in community to lift up West Louisville. And so in Love the Ville Fashion Church, we're going to bless them this Christmas with a check. So drum roll, please. Come on, help me out. Marla and Bill, we would like to gift hand in hand this Christmas in the amount with a check in the amount of fifty thousand dollars to help you pay down your mortgage so <laughs> thank you church for being so generous you guys knock it out of the park every year So yeah, as you saw there on the video, uh, it's, it's coming up. Like Christmas Eve is just around the corner. And uh, as you heard me talk about last week, in Louisville especially, the Christmas season is a time where people will accept an invitation to church like no other season throughout the year. So I'm just encouraging you right now. We've got the services stretched out four different days, right? Uh, there's Thursday, there's Saturday, Sunday, then there's Monday, which is actually Christmas Eve. There'll be seven different services. Start praying. Start thinking right now of someone you can invite with you to those services. We will put our best foot forward, I promise you. Now, one cool thing is on your way out today, we've made these sleek, cool little invite cards. You know, on one side, it's just kind of got the brand and the, the, you know, the title of the Christmas. On the other side, it's got uh, the service times. All seven of them, I and mean, trust me, you, some of you will just need one of these to remember yourself. But uh, grab some of these on the way out and use them as uh, cool little tools to invite some of your friends. All right, they'll be at the, all the different doors when you walk. All right, now, I just want to tell you that if you're new here, what you just saw with Tamara and Hand in Hand here on this stage, it's something that's actually pretty normal around this church. Like, if you're a part of this church, you start to take moments like that for granted, right? Because it's just so normal with us. That's who we are. $50,000 flowing out of our church and into an organization that's impacting and empowering beautiful people all across the city. That's what we do here at the Love the Ville Church. You see, okay, we actually believe here that small things done in great love change the world. Uh, we are actually uh, b believing here that it is our role to redefine church. Because you see, the church has a PR problem in America today. A lot of people outside the church, when they think of the word church, they think of something and it's not good. And it's definitely not the love of Jesus, and so we've just taken it as our responsibility to change that. We're actually trying to earn for ourselves a reputation as the Love the Ville Church in our city, because we believe that's what God has called us to do. Now, check this out. If you're new here, I'm going to say today we're going to talk about all that. It's kind of an insider sermon, but I can't think of a better weekend for you to check out our church because you're going to get to see what our church is all about. You're going to get to hear what we've accomplished this past year in our Love the Ville outreach. You're going to get to see where we're going in 2019. And uh, I just want to warn you, I want to warn you, like we do every year as we move into this season, there's going to be a giving ask at the end. Now, I always feel so bad for like people who show up at church for the first time on a giving weekend, you know, and it's like, oh, 
We're at a mega church, and it's a giving weekend. Surprise, surprise, honey. Hold on to your purse, right? Okay, I'm just telling you, like, like two, two things. One, we don't talk about giving every weekend. All right, we don't. So come back next weekend. We're going to launch a Christmas series called Prayers of the Ville. And trust me, I think that uh, that'll be just what you need during this Christmas season. But second, I want to tell you this. If you are here and this is your first time, when we get to the giving ask, I want you to know from the front end, you need feel no pressure or no guilt to give in that moment. You are officially pardoned, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Father, Son, Father. Okay, you're, you're pardoned. You're pardoned. You don't have to participate. But what I want you to do is I want you to listen. I want you to listen to what we say. I want you to listen to where our money goes as a church. Because I believe, like Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And today, you're going to get to get a glimpse of where our heart is as a church. And what I think you may discover is that the church you always wish existed, but never thought existed, may exist right here at the Loveville Church. Now, to begin today, I, I want to present to you a, a principle of, of giving, or a principle of generosity, really a principle of wealth management that drives the way we manage our wealth here at Northeast Christian Church. And what's so powerful about this principle is, uh, is that it's one of those Jesusisms that Jesus made popular that actually people who are Christian or not can kind of wrap their minds around together. Like even non-Christians look at this principle and say, that's conventional ris- wisdom. That's good to apply to your life. In fact, if you do apply this principle to your life, I can promise you this. People will call you generous, whether you're a Christian or not. People will call you compassionate. People will call you a good neighbor. People will call you an upstanding citizen, whether you are a Christian or not. And the reason why they will call you that is because if you apply this powerful principle, you will in fact be just that. And who wouldn't want to be that? All right, so here's the principle without further ado. And what I would like for you to do is repeat after me. Um, And we'll just kind of say this together, right? Repeat after me. To whom much is given, much is expected. Great job. One more time. Uh, To whom much is given, much is expected. And isn't it true? Isn't it true? Like as you get paid more and more at your workplace, your employers expect more and more of you. When your favorite sports team signs an athlete for like a multi-million dollar deal, you start expecting more and more of that player. Uh, The more that you have in your community, in your country, the more your community and country expects you to give to those who have less. And isn't it true for those of you who read the scriptures? God holds accountable those to whom he blesses with more. To whom much is given, much is expected. I mean, am I right? Am I right? Okay. Now, if, if it is in fact true, then the real question we should be asking ourselves today is this. Who has been given much? If to whom much is given, much is expected, then we better get to the bottom of this question, right? To who has been given much? Because to whoever in this room has been given much, woo, woo, like warning today, you're going to be held to a higher standard. Now, if you were to ask me that question today, I would give you a simple answer. To who has been given much? I would say to you. To you has been given much, and to I has, we have been given much. Who has, you has. I'm just telling you, man. Now, and I, okay, the reason why I want to say this so simply and unapologetically from the beginning is because in America, we are so good. We're so good at pointing to those people and talking about how much they have, right? We're so good at making somebody else rich and making ourselves average. We're so good at like comparing tax brackets and income levels and you know, like their cars to our cars, our vacations to their vacations, their house to our house, so we can push those rich people into the has much category and we can push ourselves down into the not as much category. But I'm just here to tell you today that if you're in this room, 99% of us sitting right here by global standards have been given so much. Perhaps we could say too much. Too much. So let me explain it to you like this. Let's pretend we had two people on this stage. We'll call them person A and person B. And let's pretend that person B makes 10,000% more than person A. 10,000%. In that situation, who has been given much? That would be person B, right? It's pretty obvious. What if person B makes 5,000% more? Who has been given much? 
that would be person B. What if person B makes 4,000% more? Who has been given much? That would be person B, right? Pretty simple answer. Now, let me make this a little more specific for you. Let's pretend that person A represents, oh, about a third of the world today that lives off $2 or less a day. That's 2 to 3 billion people on the planet Earth right now. And then let's pretend that person B represents the median American citizen, according to the Census Bureau from 2016. The median uh, income for an American in 2016 was just shy of $32,000. And you know what the percent difference is between B and A in that? A little over 4,000%. Now, let me ask you a question. In this scenario, to who has been given much? That would be to you. <laughs> and that would be to me. We have been given so much. I tell you what, if we were to go out and we were to poll uh, all the people from all across the world, and we were to ask them the question, who's been given much? They would not look at us in America and parse things like we, we do. They wouldn't ask, you know, well, what tax bracket are you in? They wouldn't compare those who make, you know, five digits to six digits. Oh, they're, okay. They wouldn't compare $20,000 cars to $60,000 cars or $400,000 houses to $800,000 houses. They wouldn't say, oh, well, those people take extravagant vacations, but those poor people in Louisville, they just go to Destin. Poor Louisvillians. Let's pray for them, right? No, okay. They, that, would, that would not be a subject of conversation, right? You know what they would do? They would look at us and they would say, isn't it obvious? Or perhaps they would ask us, why isn't it more obvious to you? So let me make it even more obvious. Uh, if you make $32,000 or more a year, did you know that you're in the top 1% of wage earners on the planet Earth today? Top 1%. Who's the 1%? For most of us, you are the 1%. If you make $17,000 or more a year, did you know that you are in the top 5% of wage earners on the planet Earth? Did you know that a high school student who works at minimum wage 15 hours a week is in the top 20% of wage earners on the planet Earth? I recently read an article that said the number one, five, six, eight, and 10 wealthiest zip codes in the state of Kentucky are in the immediate vicinity of this campus that you are sitting in right now. Now, today. Now look, why do I say that? Why am I pointing that out? Is it to make you guilty? No, it's not to make you feel guilty. Rather, it's to make you feel aware. Aware of what? You and I, we have been given so much. Amen. By global standards, we are rich. You're rich. You. Okay, check this out. The reason why you're not giving your husband a high five right now is because the fact of the matter is, is that most of us don't feel rich. Now, that doesn't mean we're not rich, but you don't feel rich. And the reason why you don't feel rich is because you have no margin, which is not necessarily an income problem. It's a spending to or past your income problem, which is a totally different sermon. But uh, let's just pretend for a second that you had to get on a plane and travel to the developing world. And explain to somebody living off $2 or less a day the financial pressures you are under. You know, I, hey, I know it's tough here in the village, but Starbucks frappes aren't getting any cheaper, okay? <laughs> you know, neither is private school, and the heating bill goes up during December. And do you know how much it pays to fill up the tank of one of these gas guzzlers I drive? To which they might look at you and say, you have indoor heat? <laughs> it would just sound ridiculous to them, wouldn't it? And the reason why is to the, the developing world, we are ridiculously rich. Did you know this Monday we set a record? On Cyber Monday, we spent $7.9 billion on stuff we don't need. In large part for people we don't like. <laughs> you know, me and Lindsay are to this point now to where we can afford to buy gifts for, like, our family and, you know, for, for you know, our nephews and nieces and all that. And uh, you know what the hardest thing about buying gifts for people is, especially those in your family? What do you give to someone who already has everything? Especially when you're on, like, a $50 limit or something. You're like, like another pair of shoes, another coat. They got a whole closet of shoes, right? Oh, another toy for his toy room? Imagine explaining that to someone in a developing country. We have a toy room in our house, you know? 
So we have been given so much. Some would say too much, right? So what are we to do about that? Well, Jesus speaks a powerful word. And that word he speaks to us is not, you should feel really bad, or you were really guilty, or it is evil to make so much money. Rather, Jesus says to us something far more productive, far more compassionate, far more heart-changing, and far more world-changing than that. Jesus says to us this, Luke chapter 12, verse 48, you've been given much, and to whom much is given, much is expected. So do much with your too much, right? Uh, It's interesting. If you've ever read Luke chapter 12, uh, in this chapter, Jesus just sort of throws down on generosity, greed, worry, and how all that will be judged someday on, on Judgment Day. He talks a lot about generosity, and I think Luke chapter 12 is one of his clearest, most unapologetic bits on it in all the scriptures. I just want to kind of give you some of the high points of it. All right, uh, start with me in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, because in this passage alone, uh, we could write a whole sermon series on it. Jesus begins, and he says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, to which we could just pray and go home, right? I mean, like, that's, that's good. For some of you, that's what your life is pointed at right now. That's what you live for to acquire an abundance of possessions. But if that is you, I just want to let you know that more stuff will never be enough. A desire for more will constantly breed a desire for even more, and it will leave you perpetually unsatisfied. This is not what your life was made for. Now, Jesus goes on, and then he tells a story to illustrate this. He says, then he told him a parable. He said, the land of a rich man produced abundantly. And this rich man thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I know what I will do. I will do this. I'll pull down my current barns, build even larger barns, and then there I will store all my grain and all my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Pause for a second. An American church, let me ask you. Can you even begin to imagine someone who is that rich? Can you even begin to imagine someone who is so rich that they can basically eat whatever they want, whenever they want? Like somebody who's so rich that they never have to worry about the food on the table. There's always food in the fridge. There's always food in the cabinet. In fact, there's so much food that half the food ends up going bad and they throw it down the trash can. Could you imagine somebody that wealthy? Do you even begin to imagine someone so wealthy that they have clean drinking water and a refrigerator full of juice and milk, a whole refrigerator for their adult beverages? Could you imagine? Could you imagine someone who is so wealthy that they actually use uh, stuff to drink as like ornaments for their wall? There's like wine bottles hanging up. Like, could you imagine? Could you imagine somebody who is so wealthy that they can just do whatever they want, whenever they want? They can buy plane tickets, travel here, vacation there. They can go out on Friday to this show, blow $100 on Saturday at a bar tab. Like, can you even begin to imagine someone that is that wealthy? Me neither. Me neither. Um, I thought you guys would laugh more than that. Listen, a spoonful of sugar... Helps the medicine. Anyway, okay, so Jesus doesn't lighten up. He says, I want you to imagine a rich man like that. Uh, next slide. Then he says, I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine God showing up and saying to him, you fool. You fool. This very night, your life's being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be then? And then Jesus says, so it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. He then said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, Do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body and what you'll wear, for it's the nations of the world that strive after all these things. To which I would ask you this, America, do you know any nations in this world that strive after such things? Okay, me neither. So let's go to the next slide. (laughs) Jesus says, here's the solution, though. Instead, strive for God's kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. Sell your possessions 
and give alms. And that Greek word there for alms is a powerful one. It means something like mercy, something like compassion. Basically, Jesus says, channel your funds toward charitable giving that goes to mercy initiatives and compassion projects. Be generous. And make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Next slide. Blessed is that worker, he says, whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Truly, I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all his possessions. And from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. Now, I love this last little metaphor Jesus uses here. Basically, he says, look, I'm the master, and you're the worker. And all that you have now has been given, entrusted to you. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the owner. You're the steward, right? And I'm gone for a while, but one day I will return, and I'm going to ask you what your return is on my investment. What will it be? To which some of us are tempted to say, well, okay, yeah, you're, you've, you've given a lot, you know, Jesus, but I'm, you know, I'm a talented, I'm a talented person. I've made some, some serious wealth for myself. You should give me a little bit of credit to which Jesus would look at you and say, oh, you're talented. Guess who gave you those talents? That would be me. You didn't choose your natural talents. They chose you. Oh, you're wealthy. Guess who allowed you to be born into this prosperous time and place? You could have been born someone else. Uh, you could have been born somewhere else. You could have been born in a place in time where wealth was impossible for you. But I gave to you something different. To which some of us would then be tempted to say, okay, you gave me this time and this place and these gifts, great. Thank you, Jesus, but I work hard. Right? I, work, I went to school for several years, and I worked my rear end off. And then I work 60-hour weeks, 70-hour weeks. I put in the time to make what I have. To which Jesus would say, good. Good. I am glad you work so hard. Hard work honors God. But there is one necessary prerequisite for hard work. Being alive the breath you just took in your lungs and all the breaths you took before that and all the breaths you shall take after that. And guess who gave you those breaths? That would be me. And you're not guaranteed another. I gave it all to you. I'm the owner. You're the steward. I'm the master and you're the worker. And I'm telling you this not to make you feel bad. I'm telling you this to make you feel responsible. Or perhaps we could say it to you like this. So I believe Jesus is telling us. He's saying wealth doesn't make you culpable but it does make you accountable. Wealth doesn't make you special, but it does make you responsible. And if the statistics are true about America, and if the statistics are true about the neighborhoods immediately surrounding our church, then we are more accountable and more responsible than most. Now, with that said, let me say this. That is why I'm so proud of our church and so glad to be a part of this church because we take that responsibility very, very seriously. In fact, about four years ago, we decided to change the way that we live and that we give. And over the past three Christmases, we have raised collectively over $1.4 million, of which 100% has gone back to what Jesus would call alms, charitable giving. Last Christmas alone, we raised over $800,000. And over 2018, we have made so much of that in our city and around the world for Jesus. And I am proud today to be able to celebrate with you some of the things your generosity has accomplished. I asked our outreach team. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was like, listen, I'm preaching on this, and I need a list of all the things we got done, because I want the church to know where their money, their money is gone. Uh, but I only got about five or ten minutes to do it, so keep it short. And you know what they sent me? A book. I mean, it's like, it's like 50. They're like, sorry, we're keeping it as short as possible, but it's like, there's like 15 pages. These pages, like, page eight is like a full page of text. I can't read all this, so... So check it out. I was like, listen, I just, I'm just going to give them a highlight. And they're like, all right, give them a highlight. So let me just give you like just some highlights of all that we have been able to do through our Love the Ville outreach over the last year. Now, if you've been around here long, you know that we have three branches. 
when it comes to Love the Ville. We have our local school partnerships, our local community partnerships, in which we focus on what Jesus would call the least of these, those who are oppressed, those who are marginalized, those who are forgotten, those who are invisible. And then we also have our global outreach partners, which impact global communities locally and all around the world. Now, I want to start with schools because Love the Ville started with schools, and for a long time it's been our bread and butter as a church. Uh, over the course of this past year, we have been able to move from seven intimate partner schools to nine intimate partner schools in Jefferson and Oldham County. And when I say we have an intimate partner school, what I mean is that we have a school's pastor. That's right. We have somebody who works full time, Randy Gordon, you guys know him, and his job is to be in these schools. He's in these schools on a weekly, monthly basis talking with the administrators, appreciating and serving the teachers, recruiting volunteers to minister to the kids of the school, and constantly asking the question, how can our church help? How can our church help? How can our church help raise the bar of excellence so that these kids can go out and unleash their full potential on the world? Because that's what our church cares about. Uh, in our nine intimate partner schools, we've been able to lead 10 family-friendly events that have served thousands of parents and thousands of students, many of which you guys have served at. Uh, we were able to take our summer reading program back out again this year with our Love the Ville reading trailer. Have you seen the reading trailer that we've kind of upfitted? It's like a classroom on the inside. We take it out to five strategic neighborhoods, and we read with kids during the summer to help bridge the reading gap. Uh, we made hundreds of compassion kits. We have bought hundreds of bulletin boards. Uh, we gave supplies for student appreciation awards. Uh, we were able to lead a ribbon cutting ceremony for the opening of the Westport Early Childhood Center right down the road. We funded a bus driver appreciation initiative. We put on the graduation ceremony for the teenage pregnancy school. 220 teachers this past fall were supplied with their exact wish lists for the school year. Some of you remember grabbing some of the cards and going out shopping for these teachers. I mean, when we went and delivered the like eight trailer fulls of, of supplies to these teachers, they were dancing in the halls, crying, thanking us. There was like a Twitter storm of appreciation about our church. And also this fall, 2,000 of you uh, blitzed 34 of our, our local schools to get them ready for the school year. And that is not a, pris, uh, a misprint on the last, last line. 318,000 meals were given to hungry kids of the Ville this year after our Easter services. Because of your generosity. Hashtag two cheeks, two weeks, y'all. That's some of my best leadership at Northeast. <laughs> and look, I could go on talking about schools all day. I just want you to know, that's just a snapshot. That's just a snapshot of what goes on in our schools. We have armies of people in our partner schools every single week loving the Ville. Now, our community partnerships are a little newer than our school partnerships. But I have been so thrilled to see how they've blown up over the last year. Uh, this year, we've been able to give thousands of meals and hundreds of hours to the homeless again. Just recently, we were able to move three homeless families out of living in their cars and into furnished apartments, and we're getting them on track so they can get jobs. Our PB&J ministry packs 150 meals for the homeless every single week. Uh, there's a group called God's Girls that has a lot of ladies in it from our church that have served thousands of meals to the homeless this year. We fed Thanksgiving to 300 residents in Portland, and we were also able to give 100 Thanksgiving baskets uh, to the Portland families. Uh, we just cut a check, as you saw, for $50,000 to Hand in Hand Ministry, who's working in West Louisville. We gave $10,000 to the UofL FCA that serves over 300 athletes and coaches. We gave $50,000 to Scarlet Hope that's helping women get out of uh, the adult entertainment industry and make a new way of life for themselves. And we started a new partnership with Prisoners Hope because we felt like we should be in some of these prisons surrounding our churches. Now, that has been so successful that I gave it its own slide because I want you guys to know what we're doing with that. And I want some of you guys to get involved with that because we need some committed volunteers in our prison ministry. Uh, first, we're in the KY uh, State Reformatory, and we're also in the Kentucky uh, Correctional Institution for Women. Uh, and there this year, we were able to teach a class on reentry and strengthening family ties. And the reason why we taught a class on strengthening family ties is because when men get out, the number one reason why they reenter the system is, you guys know, because they don't have strong family ties. And we don't want them to end up back in jail. So this class is just vital for them. Uh, we've hosted many celebrations for prisoners. We gave 475 uh, Bibles away. We fed Thanksgiving to 30 families of the incarcerated, gave 30 care backpacks to their children. And this December, we'll present 77 local kids with a Christmas gift on behalf of their incarcerated parent. Because we want them to know that their dad or their mom loves them, and there's a church out there that loves them. And ladies and gentlemen, that is just a snapshot. 
That is just a snapshot of what is going on in our community every single day. Because so many of you are committed with your money and with your time to love the bill. And I'm not done. Check this out. Here's our global accomplishments this year. And again, it's just a highlight. Um, we were able to sponsor five refugee families that ended up in our city through Kentucky Refugee Ministries. That's probably somewhere around 30 uh, people. And because of our sponsorship of five families, uh, which, believe it or not, I know that doesn't sound like much, but that's the most any organization has ever, respons- uh, has ever uh, sponsored with KRM. And so because of that, uh, we were the recipient of the 2018 Donna Craig Outstanding Service Award from the Kentucky Refugee Ministries. Congratulations, church. Uh, we were given, uh, or we gave $50,000 to the Jasper House, which is a women's empowerment group in Haiti that gets women out of abusive or exploitative relationships and gets them on track to make a life for themselves. We actually sent a, an outreach team down there earlier this year. There were therapists on that team that trained the therapist at the house. There were uh, business women on that team that taught a class on finance, entrepreneurship, and basic business. There were even some uh, uh, medical uh, professionals that went down with that team that did a women's clinic and examined all the women there at, at the house. They even, they even delivered a baby, C-section. Pretty cool. Uh, we brought a lifetime of clean water to 578 people in the developing world because of our workout for water partnership. Uh, we forged a new medical partnership uh, uh, with a group called Earth Asia Mission. And here's this group's pretty cool. You know what they do? Basically, they take natives out of developing villages in Asia. They train them in medicine up to like a PA level. And then they send them back into their villages so that they can provide health care in places where health care would have never been accessible otherwise. And that puts us now on four different continents around the globe. And next year, I'd like to be on five, you know? Yeah. And here's the deal. That's not, that's not all. It's just a snapshot of what we we're accomplishing on a global scale. Maybe the coolest thing about this last year is the way we've been able to start sharing Love the Ville with other churches and organizations. We got invited to a conference this past summer in which our team was able to present to 120, 120 church leaders uh, what we were doing uh, with the Love the Ville movement. And then about a month ago, we hosted on-site our first ever Love the Ville conference in which 10 churches from across the country came in for 24 hours. We just poured on them everything. You, you, you've taught us our story, and they're taking it and implementing it all over our city and all across the country. We are now stewards of a movement. We're not just doing addition. We're doing multiplication. This is not local anymore. It's national, and it's because you've been so committed to it. Now, it was interesting. At the end of the conference, though, one of the church leaders there came up to me, and he asked me this question. He said, hey, uh, the service, the generosity, that's good and all. It's kind of dismissive, right, which annoyed me. But he's like, that's good and all. Uh, but let me ask you, Tyler, what's the point of throwing some mulch on a lawn? What's the point of feeding someone a meal if they just end up going to hell anyways? Now, it's a little bit of an abrasive way to ask the question. But I was trying to be as gracious as possible, so I think I, I get what he was asking. I think what he was asking was, does it really work? Is all this investment in love the village you guys are doing, is it really pointing people to Jesus. And in that moment, I was able to tell him story after story after story of life change in our church. I was able to tell him uh, the story of the local school principal uh, who's now attending our church because of Love the Ville. She started attending a couple months ago. When we found out who she was, we asked her why she started attending, and she said, because you guys kept showing up year after year after year and serving my school. And so I thought when I, when I was going to re-engage with church... It might as well be with your church because I want to be a part of a church like that. I got to tell them the story of a mother and father who began attending our church about a year ago. Uh, they said that their family story and our church's story intersected with their daughter. Now, the mother said, I'll admit, my daughter's been an atheist ever since high school. She made some bad choices, uh, you know, in her teenage, early 20 years. She ended up drugs, alcohol. Uh, married to an abusive man, and she had a kid with him. Before you know it, she had to flee the home in order to make sure that her kid was safe. And in that moment, when my atheist daughter was at her lowest and in her greatest time of need, this mother said that our church showed up for her with an amazing gift and an invitation to last year's Easter services. And surprisingly, this young atheist girl accepted our invitation. And she came 
to our Easter services. And she heard the message about Jesus risen from the dead and the opportunity to have that same new life inside of you. And then two weeks later, this young, bruised and beat up mom got baptized and gave her life to Jesus at our church. And so this mother said she was really, really surprised when her atheist daughter called her the next week and invited her to go to church with her. <laughs> she had gotten my, my husband's attention. We hadn't been to church for 10, 20 years, but we wanted to see what this church was all about. So she said they drove 35 minutes to attend here and immediately fell in love with this place. She said probably the thing that captured me first was how committed you guys were to public schools. She said I worked in the public school system for 26 years. I knew the need there firsthand. And then she wrote to me this, and I want you to hear this, church, because I carry this letter around with me everywhere. Uh, she wrote, I have truly found my faith for the first time thanks to the church. I sing and cry during worship. I listen to the sermons. I have inner peace. I've learned to pray. I ask God each morning to help me make a difference in someone's life, and my next step is baptism. And I just want to say thanks for how Northeast has impacted my life. You are a true gift from God. <laughs> okay, one more story. I got a letter. Got a letter about a month or two ago from a young 20-something uh, who's connected to our church named, uh, we'll call her JJ. All right? and, uh, and JJ reached out to me and she said, hey, I just want you to know that I, 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 I don't believe in your God. I'm not a Christian. I'm not into organized religion. I don't like the church. But my in-laws are a part of your church. They talk about Love the Ville all the time. They truly live the Love the Ville lifestyle, like truly. In fact, she said that her father-in-law is like the father that she never had. And so she said when her father-in-law shared with her a sermon series we did recently on mental health, she decided to listen to it. And then she said this. She said, I just want you to thank your church. For giving someone like me who's felt like she has had no voice a voice on such a controversial topic. Well, immediately I wrote her back and I was like, hey, um, I know you don't go to church, but you should, you should come to our church because, you know, obviously you, there's a connection here. And this is what she said to me. She wrote me back and she goes, listen, I'm not, I'm not a Christian, all right? I'm not into organized religion. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't, I don't like the church, but, she said, but. If I ever decide to come to church, I promise you I will come to your church. Now, check this out. Two Fridays ago at a Love the Ville church function, guess who I got to meet for the first time serving with our church? JJ. And what an amazing step toward Jesus she took just there. You know, look, JJ, if you're out there today, if you're listening, if your father-in-law sends this one to you as well, um, I just want you to know that I tell that story not in an egotistical way. Okay? I don't tell that story in a way where I'm like, ah, we're going to get you in the baptistry. Ah. You know, like, that's not, just, like we, don't, we don't roll like that here, okay? Like we, we love for the sake of love. I tell that story because I and our church just think, we think it's so beautiful. I think it's so beautiful that we have this difference between us. Like, you're not a Christian, and I am. You're not into organized religion, and I, and I lead a sometimes organized religious group. <laughs> and, yet, and yet, it's so beautiful that the love of Jesus can bring us together. And your story has given me energy for a new season of ministry. So I thank you for that. Now, I could go on telling stories forever. I could. But we don't, we don't have forever. Uh, so I just want to thank you for making those stories possible. And I want to tell you, those are just a few of the stories, and those are just the first stories. This movement's four years old. It's four. Imagine what kind of terror we will be when we're teenagers, okay? <laughs> Imagine what kind of impact we will make 20 years from now. Imagine what kind of reputation this church will have 30, 40 years from now. Imagine how we will change the trajectory of a generation here on the side of the world. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. So look, uh, with all that being said, we got our outreach team together, and uh, we, we started crunching the numbers, taking into consideration all that we did last year. 
taking into consideration what we want to do next year, all right? I mean, like, here's a list of some new stuff that we want to do. Uh, we want to plant a Love the Ville church on or near the U of L campus. We want to build and strengthen partnerships in West Louisville. We want to impact those organizations that are serving in uh, the realm of mental health. We want to create a first-class on-site equipping space for Love the Ville training of other churches. And we want to make school blitz the most well-attended Sunday of the year for our church, right? We've got some big dreams, right? So taking those dreams into consideration, taking all that we want to continue to do in consideration, and taking into consideration the fact that you guys gave uh, over $800,000 last year. This year, we believe to get everything done in 2019, we are going to need... Bum, ba, da, ba, one, one million uh, dollars in giving to the Love the Value Fund. Now... Okay, you clap, you clap, <laughs> but if we are going to pull that off, then here's what's going to have to happen. We are going to need 100% of you, 100% of you to give an above and beyond sacrificial gift to our Love the Relief Fund. 100%. If you're here in the room, if you're online right now, like 100%, even if you're not a Christian, but you want to be a part of the peace and prosperity of our city, we need 100% of you. To give, an above and beyond gift. Now, the reason why I say above and beyond is because the temptation, Northeast people, is to shift what you currently give just to love the bill. But that would be robbing Peter to pay Paul, and it would undercut some of our vital ministries, our children's ministry, our women's ministry, our adult ministry, our first impressions ministry. And we won't see that. We won't see that. This is an above and beyond sacrificial gift. And I promise you, if you do that, 100% of that which goes to our Love the Ville Eve fund, 100% of it, will go into our Love the Ville outreach. I've crunched your numbers this week. And uh, we figured out that to get to a million, if we have 3,000 giving units, which wouldn't be 100%, but it would be close to it, 3,000 giving units at $333.33 would get us to a million, a million bucks. Now, check this out, though. I know that's a lot of money for some of you. So I got my calculator out, and I really crunched the numbers even further. And I figured, I figured this out. Okay. If one giver today <laughs> were to just write us a check for a million dollars, we could put this baby to bed. We start talking about 2020, okay? So you never know who's in the room, all right? I mean, I've been praying, I'm just saying, I've been praying Bobby Petrino would show up because I know that he got so, anyways, okay, bad joke. <laughs> Let's take it a different, this is going in a bad direction. All right, so. So here's the easiest ways to give. Uh, you can give on the app. You can give online, necchurch.org backslash give. Uh, you can give at our church service. You can snail mail it. We'll be checking the mail every day for the next month, I promise. Uh, just make sure you designate it to uh, the Christmas Eve fund, and it'll get to the right place. All right, closing word. I know that for a lot of us, a million dollars sounds like too much. Sounds like too much to me as well. But the reality is, is that we have been given so much. Many would say too much. And the reality is that Jesus made it clear, to whom much is given, much is expected. So let's make so much out of our too much. You know what I believe? I believe that the future belongs to the bold. And maybe it's just how I'm wired, but I do not want to be a part of a church. I don't want to be a part of an organization that's just like, eh, meh, with their goals. I don't want to be a part of a church that's average. I don't want to be a part of a just another church. I don't want to be a part of a church that likes to maintain the status quo. No, I want to be a part of a church that is committed to being the cutting edge of compassion. And I believe that's church. You know what I want to be? I want to be a part of the most compassionate church in the most compassionate city in the United States of America. And I believe that's this church. So let's be who we are. Let's make much of our too much. And let's pray that Jesus gets all the glory for it. Heavenly Father, spark another movement of generosity. Spark another tidal wave of generosity in our city this year. And let it start right here with your body this local church, Northeast Christian Church, the Love the Bill Church. Thank you for giving us so much. Let us make much with it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, thanks for being here today. Uh, if you need prayer.
please, we would love to talk with you in the fireside room. If you're new here, we would love to meet you at one of our, uh, at our guest relations kiosk there in the middle or at the fireside room as well. Have a great week. And I know my heart is heavy. Ooh, I can't take this anymore. But this is all I've got to give you. It's all I've got to give. Stop this debris.